Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and the, he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today's scripture is a beautiful part of the New Testament. It uh, summarizes the gospel of Jesus Christ in its essence in such a very succinct and clear way. We hear the word gospel a lot in the church, and sometimes we don't necessarily know what it means. Some of us may know that the word gospel means good news and it means the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, but we don't necessarily know, okay, well then what does that then mean? Paul makes it really clear what the gospel of Jesus Christ is uh, in this passage. He explains to us, uh, firstly, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And secondly, that he was buried and rose on the third day, also in accordance with the scriptures. And thirdly, he appeared to many different people and eventually to him, Paul himself. You can imagine how Paul might be a little upset with the church in Corinth when he had invested so much of his life and his teachings to them and would hear news of various types of struggles and problems in that church. Uh, and here in the 15th chapter, this particular problem, I am guessing, weighed heavy on his heart because he had heard that they had uh, questions about the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of the followers of Jesus and here Paul himself was an eyewitness of the risen Christ. Um, for their sake, Paul wrote them a letter that not only addressed these problems, but he had this 15th chapter which spoke definitively in defending the essence of the gospel and the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, Paul writes, let me remind you of the gospel that I preached to you. For they had drifted away from the gospel truth that they had first believed in. It's easy to do in a city like Corinth. There's a lot of distractions and it's easy to follow a path that leads away from Christ or away from the teachings of Christ. The first four verses of the scripture today, they make it very clear that these are non-negotiables. They speak to what the gospel is and the four verses that come after it, they give a rationale and a reason why we should believe in it. There are witnesses not just one, not just a few, but many. And the implications are profound on us, on our relationship with God, 
and how this gospel of Jesus Christ would bring life, eternal life, to us. The Wesleyan tradition, of which we are a part, it tends to emphasize that salvation is not just something that happens after we die. It is that, but it's so much more. It is here and now and has so much practical dimensions to living in salvation even today. John Wesley wrote this, by salvation I mean not barely according to the vulgar notion deliverance from hell or going to heaven, but a present deliverance from sin, a restoration of the soul to its primitive health, its original purity, a recovery of the divine nature, the renewal of our souls after the image of God in righteousness and true holiness in justice, mercy, and truth. Friends, the good news is salvation begins today. It begins with every person who receives Jesus Christ into their life, believes this simple message of the gospel and chooses to live into the mystery that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, uh, that he was raised to new life on the third day and he appeared to many. Wesley scholar Randy Maddox said in an interview that both John and Charles Wesley set a precedent for Methodists of refusing to limit themselves to only the penalty satisfaction model, the Wesleys used a range of biblical allusions to, quote, stress that Christ not only dealt with the penalty of our sin, but also brought healing power to deliver us from the captivity of sin and enable us to walk in newness of life. Thus the emphasis on the journey toward sanctification and being made perfect in love in community in our Methodist tradition. Though we don't completely understand it, somehow the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the key for us in how we may access and stand in the grace of God which is sufficient for our forgiveness, for our spiritual healing, for our redemption, for our reconciliation with God, from deliverance from sin and death, all the way to the means of our very own resurrection. There are many schools of thought and theological words that tries to capture the essence of the gospel and the profound meaning of the cross and resurrection of Christ. Christian philosopher Leon Morris writes, all of these views in their own way recognize that the atonement is vast and deep. We need all the theories. Each draws attention to an important aspect of our salvation, and we dare not surrender any of them. Even when we put them all together, we will no more than be able to comprehend just a little of the vastness of God's saving deed. The cover of your bulletins are of an ocean Have you ever stood at the ocean shore and just imagine how far and how wide and how deep that ocean goes? And it strikes us, it's immense. And even the ocean pales in the immensity of God and of the meaning of the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We don't understand it all. We don't need to, to completely trust in it. We desperately need it. And we stand in awe as God's spirit bears witness with our spirits as we open them and plant them 
with the cross as an anchor. It is the life-giving gospel that leads us into salvation, and it's the central task of the Christian church to share it with the world. The church in Corinth compromised what the gospel was. They, they only took part of it. They had problems with the resurrection, just like the Sadducees did when they encountered Jesus. They began replacing the gospel narrative of Jesus Christ with a narrative of their own that primarily came from their surrounding culture. They strayed from the gospel truth that Paul first taught them, and Paul had to reel them in and bring them back to the basics. He didn't give up on them. He was upset with them. He loved them with a kind of love that comes from God for other people. This is a modern parable that may have many different versions in circulation. Here is this one. A long time ago, there was a beautiful but dangerous rocky inlet along the coast. Year after year, there were several boat accidents and drownings and in the bay, and people who were boating or swimming they would get drawn in by the strong currents and trapped in the bay with a dangerous surf that drove them into the rocky shoreline and cliffs. And so several people who lived in the town nearby decided to establish a rescue station right on the beach on the point of this coastline where the dangerous bay began its steep, rocky, curved shoreline. They built a shed and a dock and put a small rescue boat there and got some volunteers to take shifts manning the station during the peak times of the day when the boaters would come to see the beautiful cliffs of the bay. When some of the boats inevitably did not navigate, did not navigate the currents well, they struck the rocks and the rescue boat was there and the people to pull them from the treacherous waters. The first year, they rescued many, many people from the dangerous surf and currents. And it pleased the town people very much that their idea and their help had benefited so many. And so word began to spread about the rescue station near the bay, and it brought even more people to the area. And in the second year, the volunteers rescued even more people and more and more people came to see this beautiful part of the coast they had not seen before. And so the town people chose to expand the rescue station and include a picnic area, a deck, and more docks to accommodate the boats that would come to visit the bay. The third year, more people came to the enlarged rescue station and picnic area, but it started to become more known as a picnic area and less of a rescue station. Eventually, it became harder and harder to recruit volunteers in town to patrol the waters of the bay to rescue those caught in the dangerous currents. In the years that followed, the townspeople became more and more taken with the picnic area and less and less about the dangerous waters that first brought them there. They gave up on the idea of the rescue station and left that task to the Coast Guard. But as big as the Coast Guard was with all of their resources, they could never offer the kind of coverage or help that the volunteers from the town once offered in the dangerous waters of the bay. They simply had too much area to cover. Year after year, the townspeople enhanced the picnic area with a pavilion and other amenities to allow for nicer, special gatherings, which then attracted more people and more boats. And the number of lives lost each year, not so very far from the former rescue station turned picnic area, began to rise again. It's easy to be distracted from an original idea and plan, isn't it? Paul was facing this in Corinth. They were off following the latest ideas of the culture 
and departing from even the most basic of Christian teachings that Paul had shared with them. Mission drift is another modern term which one which the business world has plagiarized from the Christian tradition. It was also a concept that the Corinthian church practiced in large measure as they gave up the truth of their gospel for the ideas of their culture. In the middle of their straying away from the truth, Paul had to remind them of the gospel that they had changed or abandoned. Friends, let me remind you about the gospel and let this good news of Jesus Christ be the defining narrative of our community life together. Don't be taken in by the charlatans out there who would have us compromise the truth of Christ. Our anchor point in life with God is Jesus, his cross, his resurrection. Let no other narrative take its place. There is no more powerful narrative than Jesus becoming human to save us, to give his life up on a cross to save ours, and be resurrected into new life with the Father as one who goes before us and prepares the way for us. This is the gospel by which we are saved and which Paul says is always of first importance. The meaning and power of the cross is as vast as the ocean and immense as the picture on the cover of your worship guide. As we journey together as a community striving to follow the example of Christ, it's important to remember that we keep the main thing the main thing. Remember these words of John Wesley. He said this, You have one business on earth to save souls. That's what he would tell his pastors. I believe there's a sense of excitement and enthusiasm in our church family right now for this new school year, for the exciting plans before us. Then we're embarking upon all of them together as a congregation By the grace of God, we are daring to go forward with this gospel of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the gospel can loosen the holds of sin, of addictions, of depression, of despair that are, I believe, all around us in this community in which God has planted us together. There are hurting people out there and I know there are hurting people in here too in affluent areas such as this one it's a little hidden and it takes some looking to see it people don't want others to see their hurts on the outside things may appear okay and peaceful even while on the inside they are drowning and struggling to just to keep their head above water. The words to the hymn, Rescue the Perishing, go like this. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave, weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus, the mighty, to save. Christ Church, we are a rescue station that depends on the death and resurrection of Jesus every day. This past week, I saw the value that this congregation puts on relationships with one another, with the depth of care and concern. Excuse me a moment. We lost three church members this past week, or we celebrated their lives. And the depth of care that I saw among you. It ran so deep. 
as we celebrated the lives of Marilyn Dromgoole and Hugh Reeves and David Garrett. And together we found such comfort in this resurrection that Paul so boldly, boldly talks about in identifying it as the essentials of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that was the anchor for us and for those three families. Together we found such comfort as we remembered loved ones and gathered around the cross of Christ and trusted in the resurrection together. Stay near the cross, Paul would say to us. It is life in more ways than we can possibly comprehend. I remember Christian musician Russ Taft did a terrific version of the hymn, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross. The words are, Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all, a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Today is Communion Sunday, that sacrament in which we gather around as a community and enter into the mystery of Christ's presence with us and his life-giving power that's in the cross and the resurrection. We come to the cross, we come to the table knowing that Jesus Christ is here. He alone is our spiritual lifeline that, it, that can equip us for life and to save others' lives in sharing the lifeline of Christ. He is the source of our rescue, our Savior, our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.